Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tonight. And go ahead and stand for the reading of the word. And just want to once again remind parents that go ahead during the invitation to dismiss and get your children so that the workers, if they'd like to be in for the family meeting, will be able to. Uh, with us uh, taking the Lord's Supper this Thursday, I wanted to prepare our church for that tonight and just preach a little bit on that subject. Uh, the Lord's Supper is an important thing. I'm glad two of you agree with that. That's I'm glad I'm preaching on it tonight. The Lord's Supper is an important thing. It's a sacred thing that God, one of the two ordinances that God gave the church was baptism and the Lord's Supper. And, and it's just been my belief as a shepherd, you don't go into something like that uh, without some preparation. Amen? Amen? And so I want to just give some, I'm going to try to be semi-brief uh, tonight, but I want to just give us some thoughts about the Lord's Supper as we prepare for that uh, as a church family. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. The Bible says this, now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I love how he says this, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye... As oft as ye drink in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till I come. Whosoever there, uh, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that, sh that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come to eat, together to eat, Tarry one for another, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come in, that ye come that ye come not together into condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. I want to preach on this subject tonight for the better. For the better. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. I pray that you would uh, help us to ponder and consider the blessedness and, and the importance of the Lord's Supper that you've given to us. Bless the word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated tonight. The Lord's Supper is something that I remember as a young person, uh, when I was a child, uh, when I was probably more closer into fourth, fifth grade, I guess, and we went to a non-denominational church and, and every week at the altar there would be people there with trays for the Lord's Supper and we'd come and just take one and drink it. And, and I remember going years of my life having no real clue what the Lord's Supper is. And I think many people all across the globe here in America and all over the world 
partake of the Lord's Supper and tre- maybe even treasure the Lord's Supper, but don't really even know exactly what it is or, or what God has designed for it. And the truth of the matter is, is that if we do not understand the Lord's Supper, it's not because God has not communicated it. It's because we haven't taken the time to look at what God says about it. And so I want to just take a few moments tonight and I want to just show some of the things in this text that the Word of God teaches us about the partaking of the Lord's Supper. The first thing I want to look at is the place of the Lord's Supper. He says this in verse 18. For first of all, when ye, so notice he's speaking to the whole church there, when ye come together in the what? In the church. Then notice again in verse 20, he says, when ye come together therefore into one place. The first thing I want you to notice is that when the church took, when they took the Lord's Supper, they took it as a church at the church. That when the Lord's Supper was observed, all the way going back to the Lord, the Lord had His disciples with Him and they partook of the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper was also, when He says this, when you come together, that they came together knowing that they were going to take the Lord's Supper. They came together understanding that the Lord's Supper was going to be taken. And they took the Lord's Supper at the church. Also, he says this in verse 22, What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God? In other words, he says this, that the Lord's Supper is not just a casual social fellowship event. That if you want to have a casual social fellowship event, that's why you have your own house. You have your house to have people over. You have your house to have a casual event, to eat and to drink and to enjoy one another. But when it comes to the Lord's Supper, you don't do that at the house. When it comes to the Lord's Supper, you don't just have a casual event. It is something that the church does, just as the Lord gave the ordinance of baptism to the church. The Lord gave the ordinance of the Lord's Supper to the church for a church to take at the church with the understanding that we're going to take the Lord's Supper at this time. The the first thing I want to just start off and say is this. The Lord's Supper is a special observance of the local church. I remember years ago when I was pastoring in San Marcos and and, uh, there was a really lovely family and they were great people and really respect them as a father and respect them as a family. But I remember one time we were driving together and we were talking and he was telling me how him and his family were observing the Lord's Supper together as a family. And I, and I said, I said, no, I don't know how you're doing that uh, because the Lord hasn't given you that authority to do that. That's a church ordinance. And I remember showing him the word of God that when you come together in the church to take the Lord's Supper. And I just want to say there's a lot of sincere people. There's a lot of loving people that love the Lord and they want to honor the Lord. But the Lord has made it very clear that the Lord's Supper is for the church at the church, with the church. And so you see the place. Then you see this problem. You see this problem in verse 17. He says this, Now, now in this that I, de- that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now I want you to think about this. Paul says, you're coming together to take the Lord's Supper. And that's a great thing, right? But he says, in coming together to take the Lord's Supper... It's not working for your better. This is actually working for the worse. Like as you're meeting and you're assembling and you're taking the Lord's Supper, this actually isn't better for you. This is worse for you. And I don't know about you. When I read something like that, I'm thinking, man, how could we take the Lord's Supper and do it in a way that it would actually be worse for us? First of all, in what way was it worse for them? Well, notice what he says in verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, for this cause, here's why it's worse, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. In other words, you're taking the Lord's Supper and you're doing it in a way where God is chastising you and dealing with you because you're not taking it appropriately. And that is why there are people in your congregation that are sick. And think about this. 
The apostle Paul said there's people in the congregation that have died, slept, died because they've mishandled the Lord's Supper. That's pretty serious. That's pretty negative. So he's saying, this is not working out for your good. People are getting sick and people are dying because they're not taking this appropriately. So I would say this, what is causing this Lord's Supper to be taken negatively? Well, a few things. First of all, verse 18, there was divisions. He said, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there will be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. Now, we don't have time to go through this, but in the church there was divisions over leaders. So you had the Apostle Paul, who was the man who planted the church. You had Apollos, who came later on the scene, who was this fireball, just this man who was known for fervent in spirit. And so there were some people who were like, well, we're not going to follow Apollos because we we're followers of Paul because he's the one who led us to Christ. And then there's other people that would say, well, you know, Paul was kind of a softy. We love Apollos. He's a fireball. And then it's funny, there were the hyper-spiritual people that said, we're not following Apollos. We're not following Paul. We only follow Jesus Christ. But what they were saying is, we're not going to follow anybody. And so there was divisions over what leadership they were going to follow. So you had division. You had also a heretical view of the supper. Verse 20. He says, when ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. Notice this, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? So here's what was happening. So basically, in this biblical period of time, the church would assemble at the end of the day as people would get off work. And so what would happen is the, the more wealthy, affluent people, they could get out, they either didn't work or they could show up earlier on time. But a lot of the poor or a lot of those who had more manual labor jobs would get there a little bit after everyone. And so what would happen is the wealthy would show up and they would eat the Lord's Supper like it was a meal. They would eat the bread and drink the juice and it would be like a fellowship event and they would do it before the whole church has got there and then when the poor people would show up, there wasn't even the opportunity for them to take the Lord's Supper and so they were treating it like a, like a social event. They were treating it like, like it was something fun and some type of a fellowship event and then the poor people wouldn't even get a partake because they weren't considering everyone in the body of Christ. So you had, you had this... This, this lack of reverence. You had this, this lack of, of, of uh, unity in the church. Now here, here's something that we should take from this. Taking the Lord's Supper is only valuable if we take it correctly. Now taking the Lord's Supper is wonderful. But if we don't take it correctly, then it's not going to be a good thing for us. It's not a good thing. You can't just say, hey, well, we just do it and, and, and I'm glad that we do it. No, God doesn't say that. God says this is very serious and this will only be valuable if you do this in the manner in which I prescribe for you to do it. You know, one, um, you know so, so this would lead me to say this. Man, well, I don't know about you. I read about people dying. I'm saying, man, I want, how do we know if we're doing this right? Come on now. Like, like, this is kind of significant. Like, like you, know, how do, you know, how does a preacher know, okay, we're doing this right? How does the church know we're doing this right? Because then you're going to start passing the plate, and people are like, no, I'm good. Thank you very much. I'm, not, I'm good. I, I, I just got over the flu. I really don't want to get sick next week, right? But the Apostle Paul assures us that we can know for certain that we are doing it right. Look what he says in verse 23. Paul says this, for I have received of the Lord. So Paul says this, that he was taught by Jesus Christ himself concerning the Lord's Supper. And that when Jesus taught him, notice again verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. So here's what Paul said. Paul said Jesus taught me directly about the night that he gave the Lord's Supper and he passed to me the instructions of what he did and how it's supposed to be done. And then he says this in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. So Jesus started the Lord's Supper. He taught it to the Apostle Paul. And now Paul's saying I'm giving it to you to the church of Corinth. 
so that the church of Corinth could know how to take it. And guess what we have? We have his writings to the church of Corinth of what Jesus said about how the Lord's Supper is supposed to be taken. Here's what Paul's saying. We don't have to guess. We know exactly from Christ himself how this is supposed to go, what the Lord desires, what he intended, what he wanted. Here, here's the thing. We all can feel assurance and feel calm tonight that God has preserved for us the truths that we need to know to ensure we take the Lord's Supper properly. God didn't say, hey, good luck with that. We'll see. I hope you do it right. No, no, no. God said, I, I want you to know how you're supposed to do it, how I intended this. I want this to be for your betterment. I want this to be for your benefit. So I have passed it to Paul, and Paul has passed it to the church of Corinth, and I have preserved this in Scripture so that you can go to Scripture and see this is how I want you to take the Lord's Supper. Okay, so what is the point of the Lord's Supper? Well, look what he says in verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in, what's the next word? Remembrance. Remembrance. Notice verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in what? Remembrance. Remembrance. Here's what the Lord's Supper, the purpose of the Lord's Supper is. It's remembrance. The word remembrance means this. I love this definition. Something to assist the memory. The Lord's Supper is meant to assist us in remembering some things. Isn't that good? The Lord's Supper is positioned by God in our life to assist us in remembering some things that should not be forgotten. What's the first thing we remember? Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. The first thing that God wants us to remember is this, that his body was broken for us, was the, was the breaking of his body. Think about Isaiah 52, 14, it says, as many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man. His form more than the sons of man. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, him, of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Amen. Different people have described the process of the crucifixion. One wrote it this way, judging from non-biblical descriptions of the crucifixion in the New Testament, Jesus was placed on the cross as it lay flat on the ground. First his feet were nailed to the upright beam and then his arms stretched across the horizontal beam and nailed through the wrists just above his hands, allowing a slight bend at the knees where the body was extended. The cross was then picked up and dropped into a hole causing excruciating pain as the weight of his body pulled at the already torn flesh around the nails. Frederick Farrar described it as this, a death by crucifixion seems to include all the pain and death can have of the horrible and ghastly dizziness, cramping, thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, traumatic fever, shame, publicity of, mortif uh, publicity of shame, long continuance of torment, Horror of anticipation, mortification of intended wounds, all intensified just up to the point which they can be endured, but stopping just short of where it would give the sufferer the relief of unconsciousness. The unnatural position of the cross made every movement painful, the lacerated veins and crushed tensions throbbing with incessant anguish. And I could go on and on. One of the reasons why we take the Lord's Supper is this. We remember the incredible suffering of our Lord. The, the breaking that his body took for you and for me. All that was involved in him bringing us salvation. The second thing is in verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped saying this 
cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The second thing we remember is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, when they would offer a sacrifice, they would shed its blood. The blood was the payment for the sins of the people. Those animals were a picture of what Jesus would do for us. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment... So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. When we take the Lord's Supper and we, we eat of the bread, we remember his broken body. And when we drink of the cup, we remember the blood that he shed. That, by the way, he took one day to heaven and he brought his blood before the Father. And he offered his blood before the Father. And the Father saw his blood and said, I am satisfied in your blood. I accept this blood. And when you and I receive Jesus Christ... It is that blood that buys the atonement and pays for the penalty of our sin. It is about remembering. Listen, not reliving. When we take the Lord's Supper, the bread does not become the body. The juice does not become the blood. We are not reliving His death. We are remembering His death. Someone says, why? Verse 26... For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do, notice this next word, show the Lord's death till he come. I love this word, show means to bring to the forefront. The idea is this, is that you and I, we sing about it, we talk about it, we, 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 we have hymns about it, we preach about it, but, there is, but the crucifixion, the, the broken body and the shed blood is so significant and so important that God wants to have time where above all things it comes to be our focus. Where it comes to the forefront and we really meditate and we really chew on and we really think about and, and allow above all things in that moment of the Lord's Supper to think about the fact that he did this for you and me. It is good for you and me to sing about it and to talk about it and to preach about it. But the Lord said, I want to make sure that there are times in the local church where this becomes the center of attention because the magnitude of this suffering and this sacrifice was so great and I want the body as a whole to be thinking about one thing, the price that was paid for our salvation. What's the purpose of the Lord's Supper? It's, it's a time to remember. It's a time to put everything else aside and to simply focus and give our whole attention to the faithfulness of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for you and for me. Okay, so that's the purpose. But we saw that there's a problem, so I'm saying, what do I got to do to do that without getting myself in trouble? So let's talk about the preparation. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself. The word examine means to scrutinize, to look to see whether a thing be genuine or not. Paul says this, you've got to look at yourself. You've got to examine yourself. Okay, well, what am I examining for? What am I looking for? Notice again verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Then notice verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Here's the thing in the, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. There were divisions. There were people suing each other. There was sin, there was, uh, a, there was immorality, and one of the first things that each one of them needed to do was look at their life and say, do I have sin in my life that I've not repented of, that I've not made right with God, 
Are there some things that I'm just going through life and I'm just harboring and I'm just allowing and I'm just living in sin and I'm just allowing this? And the very first thing we have to do is we have to say this, am I clean before the Lord? And let, let me just say this, I'm not talking about, because I, I know how God's people are. God's people are such good people and they think, well, what if I miss something? Wait, if you sincerely are looking before your heart, before the Lord, if there is something that the Lord knows you need to know, he's going to bring it to your attention. And so if you come before the Lord sincerely evaluating yourself and you've confessed all that you need to know, then that's going to be acceptable with the Lord. He's not talking about stuff you don't know about. He's talking about stuff that you're not dealing with, that you're harboring, or the fact that you're not even trying to discern what's in your heart. The second thing you have to examine, we have to examine, is our attitude. He says in verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Now look at this key phrase, not discerning, not discerning the Lord's body. The word discern means to understand the importance of, to, to realize how serious something was. See, they weren't discerning the Lord's Supper in this sense that they were coming together and making it like a potluck. They were coming together and treating it loosely and frivolously and bringing the bread and eating the bread and drinking the cup. And if there was some left for people, then they would, then, then too bad, or that's great. And if there wasn't any, then too bad. They weren't discerning the severity of what they were doing. Here's one of the things that we have to do. One, before you and I take the Lord's Supper, we want to make sure that we've examined ourselves for known sin or sin that the Lord would reveal. And then the second thing is this. We want to just make sure we have the right attitude. That there's a reverence about it. That there's a holiness about it. That we understand, man, we're talking about the, we're talking about, we're talking about the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. This is significant. And we need to realize that it's serious. Now, now, someone might say this, okay, I'm reading all this, and, and this is just too scary. I want out. Now, I want you to see what Paul says, though, about that in verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread. Did you get that? Paul says, look, examine yourself, confess what is needed, come with the right attitude, and then have confidence in taking it. Don't, don't worry, don't, look, God loves us. God's not looking, God's not looking for ways to make us sick. God's not looking for ways to judge us. God's not, God's not putting the list in front of us saying, oh, you didn't do it right. No, here's what God wants. God wants us to simply understand the ramifications and to have a sincere heart that as best as we know, we're right before God. And if we've done that, let him take, take of the bread, drink of the cup. And, and allow that special time of meditating and contemplating and, and going and allowing the truth of Jesus' death for you and me to come to the forefront because it is a very special, it is a very unique time that it almost like reinvigorates us with an appreciation for what Jesus has done for us. So look, don't, 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 don't allow these things to cause you to be afraid Understand the heart of God. Allow these things to simply say, okay, I'm going to examine, I'm going to confess, and I'm going to have a good attitude about this and see that it's sober, and I'm going to come, and I want to partake, and I want to remember the Lord as a local church bringing to the forefront what Jesus Christ has done for me. And then one more thing, the perpetuation of the Lord's Supper. Look what he says in verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread... Now, notice that Paul didn't say, eat this bread and drink this cup X amount of times. Uh, people say, Pastor, how, how often should we take the Lord's Supper? As often as we do. How often that church takes it once a year, that church takes it every Sunday, that church. No, no, how often should they do it? Well, as often as they do it. You know, the implication is there is that the Holy Spirit is going to lead different churches to have the Lord's Supper Certain amounts and certain rates and maybe in certain seasons. We will always, Lord willing, take the Lord's Supper right before Easter because 
Obviously, it's right, right. That's when they, Jesus took it. But I also believe that there are many times in the fall, oftentimes around Thanksgiving time and sometimes in the summer. And I've experienced sometimes where it's just like, man, just the Lord presses upon our heart. We need to take the Lord's Supper. We need to observe and we need to, we need to contemplate his, his death. There's no right or wrong answer here. The, the right answer is we do it as often as the Holy Ghost leads us as a church to take it. Man. And I want you to notice one more thing. We keep taking it until the end of verse 26. Ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Until the day comes that we don't have to do this anymore. Until the day comes that we're in heaven with the Lord. Until the day comes that we're before him in victory and in glory. We, we take the Lord's Supper as often as the Holy Spirit leads us. Until the Holy Spirit leads us to heaven. And then we're with him forever. So here's the statement. He said to the church, you take it for the worse, not for the better. And here's what the Apostle Paul would encourage us tonight. Let's take the Lord's Supper in a way that makes us better. Amen. How are we going to take it? Let's take it in a way that makes us better. We will be better if we are right with God and with our church family. We will be better if we are sober-minded we will be better if we are focused on the Lord's sacrifice. So let me just walk through how the Lord's Supper will go Thursday night. It's a different service than any other service that we have. When you come in on Thursday night, we ask that you enter quietly. We ask that it's not a fellowship time. It's not, kind of, it's not our typical happy social celebration time. It's more of a somber time. It's a quiet time. Rather than having people kind of sit wherever, we want everyone to begin to sit towards the front and we all sit together as a family and we just fill the seats until we go all the way to the back. We will, I would recommend when you come in, if you get in early, you just take some time and read the scripture. Read about Gethsemane, read about the trial. Read about the crucifixion and just contemplate it and think about it. I recommend if you have time that day that you do that. And you just spend some time talking to the Lord and thinking over the scripture and thinking about everything that he's done for you. We will have some time in the service for you to make sure you have time to examine yourself. I know many of you, you'll get off work and you'll just drive straight here and you, wouldn't, you won't have had the proper time maybe to just clear yourself with the Lord. We'll have a period of time where we'll let you kneel and just make sure before the Lord you're good and to give yourself, kind of allow yourself to catch up to where we are uh, as a church and to prepare your heart for what we're going to do. And then we will observe the Lord's Supper as a church family. We will remember the broken body. We will remember the shed blood. And then when we are done, just as the Lord did that night, they sang a hymn, and then the Bible says, and then they departed, and they left. And what we'll do that night, we won't socialize, we won't hang around, we will just quietly depart in a spirit of the forefront of the death of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ, and we will just quietly leave with the truth of Jesus' suffering for us, kind of hovering over our hearts and, our, and, hovering over our hearts and our minds that night. And then we'll come back Sunday and celebrate the resurrection. Amen. And there'll be some bright colors. And there'll be a lot of socializing. And there'll be a lot of joy. And hopefully there'll be a lot of salvations as well. And so I want to, I want to encourage you and encourage our church family. This Thursday we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We come together. We remember. And I hope you'll be here for that. I hope you'll make it a priority to come. And as we come, remember... You need to prepare yourself. Be right with God. Be right in your heart. Have the right spirit. And let's as, listen, let's as the Lighthouse Baptist Church on this Thursday night bring the, the, the broken body of Jesus and the shed blood of Jesus to the forefront of our mind. Amen? Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed. As I know parents may need to go and get your children, you're fine to do that. Father, I want to thank you so much for the Lord's Supper. I want to thank you, Father, for the observance that we have as a church family. I just want to pray, dear God, that you would uh, prepare our hearts. And Lord, I pray that it would be a sacred time, a special time. I pray that you would use it to purify the body of any sin. If, maybe there's some things that someone's been holding on to and they just need to clear their heart of it and get right. Maybe there's some, some frustration or bitterness that needs to be cleared, that we would just get some things cleared, that as we come, we'd be right with you. 
I pray that we'd come sober-minded. And Father, I pray that, that as one body, our hearts would be completely immersed on the truth of the broken body and the shed blood. We thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, as we stand to our feet tonight, the invitation is open. However the Lord has spoken, you can kneel where you are, you can come. With every head bowed, every eye closed, as we stand to our feet tonight, the invitation is open.